So lesson this morning is going to be on perseverance, right? Perseverance, I think I spelled that right. We'll see if it's up there, right? Perseverance. So the idea of perseverance, and and the lesson this morning is going to come from some real life events that I've gone through. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking about me, but I'm really, I don't want you to be thinking about me the whole time. I want you to start thinking about you as we go through this. The whole point is just to bring something relevant so that you guys can can identify with what we're talking about. Um, but in order to start, the first thing that we have to do is I have to define a term for you. I think there's one person in the room that knows what this term means before I before I say it out loud, and that, that term is Clydesdale. <laughs> okay, now you think, oh, the horse, right? And they're in the, the, those commercials at, at Christmas time. Uh, they're, but they're, they're the, the, the big horses. And that is uh, where this term comes from. But in in my life, I do I do these crazy things. I do these races. I sign up for these races. I sign up for things that I am in no way prepared for. Uh, and Jay know the, knows this more than anything because he does some of these races with me. He goes, you didn't train for this. <laughs> but I'm in no way prepared for these races. But I sign up in a specific category called the Clydesdale category. <laughs> And the Clydesdale category is uh, usually defined. There's there's a weight cutoff that has is your minimum weight that you have to be in order to be a Clydesdale. So over 210 pounds, 215 in some races. But in that range, you get to sign up and say, I'm going to compete against other guys in my weight class. Other guys in my category, the Clydesdales, right? And for the ladies, there's a thing called the Athenas. I think they, they didn't want to call them an animal. It's, you know, but it's it's fine. So there's there are these categories in certain types of races. Now, in in a sprint, in a hundred yard dash, these types of things, these short races, they don't let you get away with these things. But they understand that there is a different set of capabilities for people that are large when you're going to do miles and miles and miles of things. So uh, first, I'm not a distance runner, okay? I'm a Clydesdale, all right? Uh, and yes, I, I put my weight out there. I'm over 210 pounds. Even with the weight I've lost, I'm still a Clydesdale. It's crazy that you can lose 50 pounds and still be a Clydesdale, but it happens, okay? So I am a Clydesdale, right? I'm not a distance runner. You look at my body type and you can go, yeah, that guy's not running a lot of miles, right? I. I end up walking some of them. But when we look at these things, I'm not I'm a Clydesdale. I'm not a climber. I'm not a rock climber, mountain climber, uh climber of monkey bars. I ripped my shoulder out of socket doing some monkey bars last October. I'm still in physical therapy for it. I'm a Clydesdale. I'm not built for that. Right? Not a world-class athlete. There are in these in these divisions, there are guys, you know, they say, oh, you can there's like the recreational division, there's the sport division, there's the pro division, and then there's the Clydesdale division. Right. And they say you're not you're not recreational or sport. We understand you're total totally different. But I'm a Clydesdale. Second Chronicles 5 15, 7. But take courage, do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Weak hands. Uh, this this picture. I just as we look at this, the the idea here of uh, of the work that we do and how hard the things are. Now I will. Not, that's not a picture of me. Uh, that is not something I do. As I said, I'm not a climber. I'm a Clydesdale. This guy does not have the same power to weight ratio that my body is built with. Right, much more power and less weight, giving him these abilities. But as we think about it, the work that we do with our hands. Uh, the things that we do in, in our lives, do not let them leak. Our work will be rewarded. And of course, there's the obvious parallel here between the physical things and where we're going to get to spiritually. I'm a Clydesdale, but I did it anyway. Okay, so this is where we get into the, the idea of perseverance. Right? I'm not built for these things, but I went ahead and signed up. And I said, I'm going to do it anyway. I, yeah, there's this Clydesdale division. Sometimes there's not a Clydesdale division. It's not about winning when you do these races. It's about the idea of setting a goal and going out and meeting it. It's about finishing. Now, in life, there are, you know, we, we understand that there's this uh, participation trophy 
epidemic going around in in the country over the last couple of decades where everybody gets a trophy um, and everybody's a winner. And maybe for some things where it's where it's a direct competition, you clearly, you know, we know who won the soccer game in, in the Little League. The kids keep score, even if the adults pretend not to. Right. They know who won the soccer game in the Little Leagues. For some events, though, they are so hard that they consider everybody that finishes worthy of a medal. We see that in marathons, right? Everybody who finishes, it's worthy of receiving a medal. Now, what could be that hard? And we say, okay, marathon, that's a lot of miles, right? Uh -huh. As we as we look at a, a, a marathon, we look at the 26.2 miles, I think, is what makes up a marathon exactly, right? We look at and we say, I could, I could never, I could never do that. And that's where I was three years ago. Ah, I'm never going to do a marathon. This year, I'm kind of thinking, well, maybe I'll do the Baltimore Marathon to train for this other thing. Which sounds crazy. But the idea here is that you can do way more than you think. I did it anyway. Let's take a look here. I've, I put some pictures out here. Now, these are not pictures of me. This is pictures from the website. This is a crazy 24 hours in the desert, world's toughest mother, mother race that I did last year. You do get that filthy. You do have to climb over giant rigs. This thing down in the bottom corner there, that is a cargo net that is 30, 40 feet, feet high. And they always place it at the top of a hill just to punish you even worse. You're crawling through the mud under barbed wire. You have to help each other in this race. It is a filthy race. This race is 24 hours long. So it starts at noon. They actually give you 20, 25 and a half just to finish it, just in case you're not quite done. So 25 and a half hour long race. But you start at noon on one day and you finish on noon the at noon the next day. And they say, in order to be a finisher, you have to start when everybody starts and you have to finish you have to finish your last lap sometime after 8 a.m. on day two. So you can't give up in the middle of the night. You can't quit halfway through. I'm Clydesdale. I needed help. Right? This is not a race. And this race is not even designed. Some people go through and they can get through the whole course on their own. But this race is designed in order to where any contestant can help another contestant. You can help the person next to you. Now, the volunteers that are there, they can't help you. They say, sorry, I can't help you, but you can help each other. So then you find interesting ways where people are figuring out how to help each other across these different, these different obstacles. So you've got this 13-foot wall that you got to run up and climb up, and there are people that will bend down and help you up when you can't make it on your own. There are people that sit down here, and they will... Uh, they will let you stand on their legs and their shoulders in order to get up the wall section before you start to cr cr climb the net. They will do it for the entire race. You'll come by lap after lap after lap, and they are still there, and you thank them, and you try and figure out how to help somebody else, right? Uh, and, and so that it creates a, a sense of community. It's not easy, especially when you're at Clydesdale. But I pressed into another lap, right? I pressed on into another lap. So as, as you go through these things, you start out, it's about a five mile loop and you go and you, and you, and the first lap, they don't have any obstacles open. They just say, just run and spread yourselves out, right? Just get spread out. So you do a five mile run and you go, okay, that wasn't too bad if you've been training a lot. And for me, okay, you know, okay, I'm tired, but I can go again. And then on lap two, they start to open up obstacles and they open them up. <laughs> And it gets harder and harder, and they open up obstacles all night long. And then sometime in the middle of the night, they also change the directions of the obstacles and make you do things in different course, in different uh, orders. But they do this uh, as a way to continually challenge you for the entire race. And so I did a lap. The next lap was a lot slower. The next lap was a lot slower. They kept adding things and adding things. And if you don't make it through the obstacle, they say, no, you have to go and do this penalty lap. Just run a little extra because you couldn't make it over this, this wall. And there are some things that you have to have to complete. And as I'm doing this 24-hour race, you have a lot of time to think. You're not allowed to have music with you. You know, they play some music at different places on the course, but you have a lot of time to think. You have a lot of time to be uh to to be on your own and in your own thoughts. But you have to 
do another lap. You set a goal for yourself and you do another lap. Now you really only need, now if you did one really slow lap, you could do one really slow lap, take a nap somewhere out there and finish after 8 a.m. You can, there are people that do one lap and those are generally those helpers. They'll go out, they'll start and they'll help people and then they'll finish their last lap in the morning. They get one lap, they do five miles for the entire race. There are men and women that have done 100 miles in this race over all these obstacles every time. So I set a goal of, I said, if things go really well, I'll get 50. Maybe I can do half. Things didn't go that well. But I started, you know, at five miles. Okay, 10 miles. Well, and then as I'm watching my watch, all these little penalty loops they send me on, I keep getting extra miles. I keep getting extra, extra. <laughs> the second lap was six miles. The third lap was seven miles. <laughs> Because they kept saying, oh, you didn't, you didn't make it across this thing. Because I, I was doing it with a torn up shoulder. And so there are some things I, you know, I just couldn't do. Even with all the help that was being provided me. But I decided to do another one. Why would you put yourself through this? Well, I still don't know, know why. But, I, you know, I, I had set a goal. And I wanted to meet that goal. I wanted to see if I could do 50. If I could go all night, I could do 50. And as I approached midnight... I realized I've lost my legs. The feet now hurt with every step. My lap that started that, that first lap took me under an hour. This lap took me over two and a half. And I just knew I was done. So I'm coming in and, and, and in between every lap, uh, I, I would receive encouragement. The help that we show here, uh, the help that I showed there was the help that was out there on the course. But Catherine came along and she was my part of my pit crew. I had some cousins come in from out of town. Uh, Jill and Kip came and they were part of my pit crew. And I was running with other racers that were out there that I knew. And they had their spouses there and their friends there to be a pit crew. So in between every lap, there's somebody to say, here's something to drink. Here's a snack. What do you need? I need new socks, <laughs> right? I need new this. I need new that. But you press on to another lap. Why? Why put yourself through this? Because I set a goal and I need to get there. So I'd finished up a little over 30 miles by midnight, uh, which is a lot, but at the same time, far short of my 50 miles. And I decided I was done. And there was, there was, a time, I, my legs, it was no longer fruitful. I needed to take a rest. But I said, ah, but you're not a finisher unless you get up in the morning and continue to go. And I said, if I keep going now, I don't think I'll be able to do that lap that you have to do after 8 a.m. I won't be a finisher if I quit now. So I said, okay, I will rest. And I took what I'd consider a nap because you have to camp out. You can't go into your car. I checked the rules. You can't go back and sleep in your car. So you have to stay in a tent right there in the pit area on the side of the course. So you sleep in your tent. And so I took a five and a half hour nap. And then I got up and started getting dressed again to go again for another lap. And verses like this pop into your head when you're out there, right? Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider it that I have made it my own. Uh, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Pressing on towards the goal. I'm just going to press on to that goal. Put some pictures in between laps. So we've got Catherine there with me uh, at, in the evening as I'm getting ready to go out for, for another lap. I've got Kip there with me as I come in from a lap, and I've got Catherine there. That's actually the next morning. That's that's as as bright and bushy tailed as I could be in in the next morning there on the right, about to go out for my my morning lap and thinking maybe I could get two depending on how these legs feel. But I pressed onto another lap, and I think of all these verses. I think about finishing the race, fighting the good fight, doing what I can. I finished the race. Second Timothy four. Seven, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. 
So it's verses like this where you figure, I finished the race. What do you get when you finish the spiritual race? You get the crown of righteousness. You get the reward. Right? I have a medal that hangs on my wall that I got from this race, and this medal means more to me than a lot of the others do because I endeavored to do something difficult, and I finished the race. If we finish the race of the Lord, this race of life, if we finish this in good standing with the Lord, we get a crown. We get something of precious value to us. There is something of great value that is out there for you. It's of great value. Finishing the race, this is the medal I got. You know, you can see it kind of hanging around my neck. You can see that I'm there and still kind of smiling and clearly not showered. Clearly very filthy. You know, the, the, the mud on my, I didn't even realize, there's mud in my teeth. I didn't know it. They send you down into these mud pits out of these tubes. There's all kinds of, it's, it's just crazy. You get filthy in this race. And again, I'm thinking about this race and I'm going through this race. I'm thinking, man, I'm just getting mud. I'm getting dirty and it's painful and it's hard. But spiritually, aren't we doing that right now today? Spiritually, aren't we going through the world and we are falling into sin here and there and getting filthy? And we're stepping through things that are hard, that it's tough to get through. It's tough to say, how am I going to do that next thing? How am I going to make it across this obstacle that's been placed in front of me? It wasn't here last time I came around. Every birthday gets a little harder, right? This obstacle, whatever it is, every holiday season may get a little harder for you to uh, get through the pain of those that you miss, right? These things you say, how am I going to do this? You just try to keep moving, right? But you get filthy. Now, you might not know this. I'm not a preacher. I'm up here today. I'm not a preacher. I'm not great at this, right? Even my own children say, Jordan's better than me. I said, come on, guys. They said, well, he is. I said, okay. I think so, too. But give me a little credit, right? And they do. And they think I do an okay job. And I try. And I put some pictures up here to keep you all entertained because my voice is not that entertaining, right? And I love it when Jordan preaches, right? But I know Jordan can't preach every week because he's got his own stuff going on. And I can't preach every week. And Wayne can't preach every week. I love it when Wayne preaches. I love the preaching that we have here. So why do I do it? Because it needs to be done. You wouldn't think it. I have stage fright. A lot of people don't realize this about me because they say, well, you've always, but you're, you were in choir. You did that college a cappella thing. You, you lead singing in front of people. Even today, knowing that I had this slide up here that I was going to tell you that I have stage fright, I get up there and say, will I have the words? Will they come to me? The words are problems for me. Um, singing in a chorus is fine. I figured out. Put me out in front. Forget the lyrics. I forget the words. Need the paper. Panic happens. Not that I don't know them. Not that I can't remember them. But so many other things go through my head about all the things that are scary to me that I can't do it. I try. I overcome it many, many, many times. But even in my last time singing a solo in college that I'd sung in my group, I don't know, a hundred times, my senior going away concert, I forgot the lyrics to my solo. Started singing the second verse instead of the first one. Just messed it up. Because of fear, because of panic, because, you know, even, even though I'm gonna, so I don't read so well. The hardest thing for me to do in services is the scripture reading. It's the hardest thing. I'd rather preach than read scriptures. Why? Because I don't want to mess it up. It's the word of God. I will mess it up because I'm not a great reader. And because I think that I, I think about my stage fright and these other things, I trip over a word. And then I think about that I've tripped over the word and I had to repeat it. And was it more awkward to repeat it or should I have just kept going? These things go through my head while I'm trying to just read the simple scripture, I lack confidence. If you knew me when I was a little kid, you knew it. That little kid is still in here. 
the little, you know, everybody laughs about the little redheaded stepchild, you know, and and I'm not a stepchild, but I was a little redheaded kid. Little redhead kids get picked on. Every every kid gets picked on, right? But whatever whatever's slightly different about you, you get picked on. I lack confidence. This is not easy for me. I'm a Clydesdale, right? In everything about our worship service and leading here and teaching people about the Word of God, I'm a Clydesdale. I'm not good enough. but I've got to do it anyway. The reason why I'm talking about me is because I want you to think about you. Because when we look at these things, you might say, but I can't do that. I can't do, ah, I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. I can't, I could never lead singing, right? Uh, I've seen men say that and then I've seen them do it, right? I could never stand in front of anybody and, and talk for, for 30, 30 minutes. You want a 30 minute? No, we don't want it. Nobody wants a 30 minute sermon anymore, right? It's okay. You can get away with 22. It's perfect. But when we look at these things, you say, I could never do that. I could never walk up to my neighbor and say, hey, do you want to do a Bible study sometime? I really want to try this, right? You can't say, yeah, maybe you're not the person that can say, I know everything about the Bible and I'm going to teach you doesn't usually work well anyway. But if you say, hey, I really want to study the Bible. Would you do it with me? Because I'm kind of, uh, it's, it's my first time, right? Or I, I don't have anybody to study with here and I don't know anybody and you're my only friend here because I just moved here, right? These types of things that happen. When we get these ideas, how do you approach somebody? You say, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know. Oh. Maybe it's a friend that you have sinned with in the past. They know how bad you are. They know the things that you've done. They've seen you in it. How do you invite them to church? You just do it. You know, you, you admit that you're a sinner. You admit that you're not perfect. You admit that you're trying to be better and you just invite them and you just say, I'm going to do it. You might not think that you're capable, but you are. Because the Lord gives you strength in these spiritual things. He's not going to make you a mountain climber like that guy that was hanging off the cliff. You can maybe do that if you're young enough, right? But the Lord is going to give you the spiritual strength to do things that you have never thought possible. Even if you're a Clydesdale. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have myself, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I share, that I may share in its blessings. See, I messed up my scripture reading there. Got one wrong. I'll mess it up every time. What's Paul saying here? He's saying you have to try. He's going to try for this guy. He's going to try this way. For this lady, he's going to try this way. He's going to do all things, everything he can in order to try and save people. We've all been given the great commission that Jesus gave uh, to his apostles. Right now you say, well, but he said that to the apostles. And what are you talking about, Craig? Well, right at the end of, you know, Matthew is one of one of the accounts. He says, go into all the world and preach to every nation, everything that I taught you. Well, he just taught them to go preach. So if they were taught to all, all the things about Jesus and taught to preach and said, teach everybody else all these things, then they taught everybody to preach. It is on all of us to find some way to talk to somebody, to try. Now, you might have great success. You might have no success. But if you don't try, you're guaranteed no success. The idea of 
if you're a salesman and you say, ah, nobody's buying this stuff, I'm not making any sales. Well, how many calls did you make? Well, nobody's buying this stuff. I'm not even going to try. You're not a salesman, right? You got to call. You got to try. You got to pick up the phone. You got to send the emails. You got to fill somebody's inbox, right? Fill somebody's spiritual inbox with Christ, <laughs> with love. Try and find a way to reach out. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, and this is the New King James Version. I found that verse particularly, that, that translation good because just the, the way it reads. And that's the one that I remember, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, as I'm running these crazy races and doing these crazy things, verses like this pop into my head. And I know it's not about my physical strength. I know he's talking about spiritual strength. So the question that I placed here is, what can you accomplish for the Lord by putting one foot in front of the other? Each of these crazy races and bicycle events and things that I do that I sign up for, they all have a starting line. And the first thing you do is take a step. You have to move forward. But what will the Lord do through you if you let him move you forward? If you decide to move forward for the Lord, how powerful are you? What can you get through in your life? Now, it might not be that you are great at dragging other people into the church building and getting them here. But you might be great at encouraging those that are already here. You might be great at pointing out a little something in a different way in class or after class to the teacher, saying to the teacher, hey, did you ever look at this? You know, your quiet little manner, but you're doing something. That's a step. All of these things that we do to build up the body of Christ, to teach our family, our loved ones, our kids, all these things are counted to our glory. They're counted towards us and our goodness that we're doing here on the earth for the Lord. They're work for the Lord. He's going to reward us. That's part of our journey, right? Some days when you're training for a big race, you can run. You feel good. Some days you go to try and run and every step hurts. And you cut those days shorter, right? But you did something. And you know, you count it to your own righteousness. You count it towards your own uh, movement towards your goal of training to do better things. Some days you can sit and read the scriptures for hours and gain from them meaning from God's words. And some days you just have a song from church that sticks in the back of your head just a little bit and it carries you through something. Some days you need to call a friend and say, hey, I'm having trouble. Can you help me over this obstacle? Because I'm a Clydesdale. Can't make it over the obstacles by myself. I took a lot more help than a lot of people on that course. <laughs> Getting through life as a Christian and persevering for the Lord, it's okay to ask for help. We got a little group here, the bigger groups around town, huge groups in Texas, right? Huge groups down in the South. You can go and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. The first time we went to the Kleinwood singing, Walked in and there were over a thousand people in the room. 1,400 people, I think, that all showed up to sing these songs that we sing on Sunday mornings. And it was overwhelming to me because being a kid that grew up in churches this size and slightly bigger, these types of things, a couple hundred people, never seen a thousand Christians in one room of any faith, right? Of, of any uh, of, of, of the many different types of Christians that we look at, those that are believers, the believing world, I'd never been in a room with them. But then to know that they had like kindred faith, that they believed the same things as me about the scriptures and how we approach the scriptures, and that they believed the words that we were all going to be singing together, it was powerful. We can get help from these things. Did you see the fill? Right? I pointed out, there's dirt in between my teeth. <laughs> There was dirt everywhere. There was filth everywhere. Even, you know, changing socks in between laps, just trying to get some of that filth off. It was everywhere. 
you can imagine how good it felt to get back and take a shower after doing something like that, to get clean. You can be clean too. The filth and the grime that is on our spirits and on our souls because of the obstacles that we must endure on this earth and the things that we are trying to get through and the failings that we have, you can get through a lot of those obstacles really clean. If you can hang, swing from the monkey bars, cross the top and hang on the ropes and get across, you never fall in the mud. Some of them, they make you get muddy, but some of them you can go through clean. There are some obstacles in this life that you can get through clean. But if you fail the test, you will get dirty. Spiritually, there are sins that, are, that plop themselves right in front of you and you can get right around it. But if you fail, you will get your, your soul dirty. But you can be clean too. We're about to sing the song, the invitation song. And the song is about washing away our sins. It's about getting clean. If you don't know what the next step is in getting clean and getting your soul clean, getting rid of all the filth that's built up from your life, we're here to talk to you about that. Again, there are many men here capable of doing that, many women here capable of explaining to you if you just come and ask. It's taking a step, that step of just saying, hey, I want to do whatever's next. That step is huge because that step puts you in the race, that first step in the race. If you need help, if you need prayers, if you need help getting over any of these obstacles that are in our way every day, the sin that will drag you down into the mud and make you filthy, if you need help getting out of that, I encourage you to come forward. And if you need to be baptized in order to wash away all that grime and be clean, to start your next lap, then please come and talk to me as we stand and sing the invitation song. What can wash away?